The CPCAB Counselling Research Award 2018 was won by Sally O'Keefe for her research investigating types of therapy dropout and their association with outcome. Sally completed the research at the Anna Freud National Centre for Children and Families as part of a PhD. Situated in Hampstead, London, the centre was set up over 60 years ago by Anna Freud, just a few doors down from her father Sigmund Freud's house. Counselor and psychotherapist Barry Kopp met Sally to find out more about her research. Hi Sally, it's lovely to meet you again. Um, you received the BACP CPCAB Research Award this year for your research into dropout rates for adolescents in therapy for depression. And I'm just wondering what led you to do that piece of research? I've been working on um, two big research projects called the Impact and Impact Me studies. Um, so I first started working on the studies about six years ago. Um, and at that point, I was really interested in kind of the evidence base for um, treatment for adolescent depression. Um, and a big part of my role was um, kind of I was out interviewing young people, families and therapists about their experiences of therapy. Um, and one of the things that kept coming up when I was interviewing young people was them talking about how they stopped going to therapy. So it's something that I became really um, interested in um, and then had the opportunity to start a PhD working on this topic. And I wonder how you went about conducting your research? The, the study was part of, as I say, um, two existing research projects. Um, so the first was the impact study. So this was a big trial looking at different types of talking therapy for adolescent depression. So we recruited about 500 young people into the study um, and then we were following them up over a two-year period, um, both kind of collecting outcome measures. Um, but then linked to that, we also had the Impact My Experience study. We recruited within um, kind of clinical services, young people who had a diagnosis of depression. Um, and they were then randomly allocated to receive one of three different types of treatment. Um, so they were cognitive behavioural therapy, short-term psychoanalytic psychotherapy, and a brief psycho psychosocial intervention. Um, so they were kind of ran randomly allocated um, so that we could, the kind of main aim of the impact study was to look at their effectiveness. But this also gave us a really, fantastic opportunity to look at kind of other interesting aspects of therapy. So in the Impact Me study, we invited um, the participants that were taking part in the trial in London. We invited them to take part in interviews about their experiences of therapy. We interviewed them both before they started therapy, kind of about their expectations of therapy, um, and then at the end of therapy and again a year later. So in the post-therapy interviews, it gave us a chance to really explore kind of what they'd expected from therapy before they first met with their therapist, um, to kind of the whole story of therapy right from their very first session, um, in terms of what they found helpful or hindering factors, uh, right up to how the therapy ended. So they were really kind of in-depth um, interviews. And then we also, when we met with the young people, we also asked for permission to interview their therapists as well, so that we could kind of get another perspective on the same treatment. So I'm wondering what sort of reasons young people left therapy early for? So in the research, once I had all of this um, data, both from the, the interviews with the young people and the therapists, um, what I did was I kind of compared all of the different cases. So these were young people who'd been classified as having dropped out by their therapist. Um, and essentially what I found was there was kind of three distinct types of dropout. Mm. Um, so I kind of named these the dissatisfied dropout, the got what they needed dropout and the troubled dropout. So the dissatisfied dropout, um, and this was the majority of the cases of kind of 18 of 32 of my sample fitted into this type. So these were young people who were really critical of the therapy they received um, and they reported stopping therapy because they didn't find it helpful and didn't feel they were getting what they needed out of it. So within that, there were all sorts of different reasons or aspects of the therapy they were critical of but overall the reason for stopping therapy was because they didn't feel they were getting what they wanted out of it um, and their dissatisfaction ranged from things kind of to do with the approach such as the 
homework or having to keep a diary or the lack of structure. Um, so because there were three different treatment arms, the kind of um, aspects of it they were critical of differed. For instance, in the short-term psychoanalytic arm, one of the things young people spoke a lot about was the silence in therapy and finding that really uncomfortable and really awkward. Um, and in a way, in the other two approaches, so coming to behavioural therapy and the brief psychosocial intervention, um, it was almost the opposite of that, where it was kind of too structured um, and wanting just space to talk. Um, so there was kind of quite a lot of variation within that. Um, but one of the really interesting things from also having the therapist's account of those same treatments was it was really striking that the therapists often didn't seem to be aware of the young person's dissatisfaction. Um, so the young person often spoke about not feeling able to tell their therapist um, how they felt or the things they didn't find helpful. Um, and then from the therapist's point of view, they didn't know what was going on for the young person and then the young person stopped going, um, which was often, I think, very frustrating for the therapists because they wanted to understand that but were left um, not quite sure what, what had gone wrong. The next type was they got what they needed dropout. So these were young people who reported finding something about therapy helpful, so they felt they'd got something out of it. Um, they felt to some extent improved and that it felt like a kind of good enough time to end for them. They'd got what they needed and it was enough. Um, and this, again, was quite interesting, seeing what the therapist said about these cases, um, because for all the therapists had viewed the young people as having dropped out, at the same time, these therapists could see that there had been some improvement for the young person. So the therapist didn't seem to be left concerned that these young people had stopped going to therapy, but they would have liked to have kept working with them because in their mind, there was still more they could have worked on, there was more m more to do. Um, but at the same time, they, they could see that it was kind of a good enough ending for the young person. So it was quite interesting. There was kind of a quite a shared narrative between the young person and therapist um, for those cases. And again, that's again quite interesting, isn't it? That sometimes it's a case of we leave therapy because actually we've gone as far as we need to go at that moment yeah. in time. Yeah. And yet the therapist is left with, oh, I still want to do some more work yeah. with that. Yeah, exactly. And whose need is it then yeah, yeah. becoming? Exactly, oh. yeah. And then finally was the troubled dropout. So just four cases fitted into this type. So these were young people who had, who had really complex difficulties. Um, so often a history of abuse, often had a lot of responsibility in the family, so things like um, kind of financial responsibilities, earning money, being a carer for a family member, um, or having kind of quite unstable living, um, an unstable living situation. Um, so for these young people, they reported stopping therapy because of the lack of stability in their lives that meant they kind of hadn't been able to engage in the therapy at that time. So for these cases, it was much more to do with external f factors rather than what happened in the therapy itself. So I suppose there was something about it not feeling like the right time maybe for those young people. Um, so I wonder if they needed a different kind of support and something more flexible that fitted in around their lives because, yeah, the structure didn't, didn't seem to work for them because they just had such a lot going on. Generally, the literature suggests that it's kind of the most disadvantaged young people who will drop out of therapy and those who have the poorest or the worst symptom severity. Um, but I actually found very little evidence of that. So I found that older adolescents were more likely to drop out and those who displayed kind of antisocial behaviour. But overall, I tested a lot of um, kind of pre-treatment characteristics um, so that was kind of one of the things that led me to this study. I wondered if it was a problem with the way dropouts defined. So I was interested in then trying to see if there's a more meaningful way of categorising dropout. Um, and then I was able to look back at some of those things I tested um, before and found that the troubled dropout did have um, much more severe symptom severity, whereas the other types of dropout didn't. One of the things I looked at um, was kind of what they reported as their expectations for therapy. But actually it was quite mixed within the types where some of the young people 
um, were very kind of hopeful and um, really thought that the therapy was going to help them, whereas others were very, very ambivalent about it or were there because their mum was making them go. Or So they really had a, within each type, um, I think their kind of hopes and expectations were really a lot more mixed than that. So going into it, I definitely wondered if um, there would be something in that, but I didn't really find a, a kind of, I didn't get a strong sense of, um, in terms of what they reported as their expectations. I guess in terms of expectations, um, especially thinking about adolescence, one of, because we previously did some work around young people's expectations of therapy, and one of the things that was really striking actually was them just not knowing, like before going to therapy, asking them what their expectations were, them just really not knowing, because I think it was something very difficult for them to imagine what what does that mean to go and meet with a therapist. So I think in a way it was often quite difficult to express their expectations because it was, for most of these young people, it was their first um, kind of time going to CAMS or meeting with a kind of therapist. Um, so... So again, they weren't quite sure what was expected yeah. of them or what the process yeah, was exactly. or what they would be yeah. able to do or yeah. not do. Yeah, so I feel like they almost weren't that opinionated about what they wanted from it before they went. But once they'd actually met with someone, then they were very able to articulate whether or not this was someone that was going to help them. And was there a difference there again within the age group? Um, no, there, there wasn't. Um, I mean, in terms of the sample of the wider study, um, the kind of average age was 15 to 16, um, and that was similar within the types. Um, but obviously it's quite a small sample, so um, I didn't get any sense of that. But, um, yeah. So I'm wondering from what you're saying there whether that leads on to sort of further exploration and research into this area. Yeah, so the study I'm working on now, um, having completed the study we're talking about today, the dissatisfied dropout, because this had been um, kind of the most common type in my sample, I was really interested in trying to understand this more um, because I wondered if it just isn't realistic to expect young people to be able to express their dissatisfaction to their therapist. So I wondered if there's other ways we might be able to pick that up, um, kind of warning signs of dissatisfaction. Um, so one of the really great things about my research being part of these wider studies is we also have the um, recordings of the therapy sessions for these cases. So what this allows me to do is to then look specifically at what happened in the sessions prior to the the dissatisfied dropout. Um, so I'm particularly interested in thinking about this in terms of the therapeutic relationship um, and drawing on the literature from ruptures in the therapeutic relationship. Um, so there's a measure that I'm using which looks at kind of tension in the relationship and whether um, and if ruptures aren't resolved in the relationship, whether that might help to understand more about dissatisfied dropout. So I'm wondering also, you say the word dropout, um, is, is that a term that we use as clinicians or is that the term used by the client? That's a really good question actually, because definitely when we were interviewing the therapists, they, they used the word dropout. Um, but in all of the young person interviews, they very, very rarely used the term dropout and they didn't refer to it in that way um, and almost all of them referred to how they stopped going and um, so in terms of how they think of how the therapy ended they they stopped going they didn't see it as them dropping out the word itself I th drop out has negative connotations and um, I think if you speak to clinicians it's it's thought of as something that needs to be avoided it reflects badly on services if dropout rates are high. Um, and I think in my research, what I've shown is that actually that it kind of challenges that and suggests that actually sometimes dropout can have a positive meaning and some young people dropped out and it was kind of appropriate and it was okay. Um, so I think this is what, for me, what research is all about is um, testing what we 
think we know and making us challenging, challenging us to think about things in a different way. Thank you.